Section 2.2, the discovery of atomic structure. So by about 1850, uh, scientists realized that atoms consisted of charged particles. So even though they, they were called atoms, which means indivisible, uh, they must be made up of something smaller. And that not only were they made up of something smaller, but these, these small parts could have charges involved. So there were, you could make something positive, uh, you could make something negative, and negatives and positives, remember, attract together. Negatives and negatives would repel, and positives and positives would repel. That's the law of electrostatic attraction. So these subatomic particles, they weren't quite sure what they were or why they were. And so the end of the 1800s, uh, lots and lots of experimentation was being done. So one of the first uh, things that was uh, studied was cathode rays. So if you uh, hooked up to a battery, so batteries had just been in, invented mid, mid century, and to where that there was a, char a, a, a source of charge, you could get a beam across a, uh, a gl uh, evacuated glass, uh, like, a, like a light bulb, where you could get a beam, and they, they painted it with phosphorus so that you could see it, you could see this beam, that's the light green that you can see, and the beam is going from one side to the other through empty space. And what also was very interesting is that you could def deflect this beam with a magnet. So a magnet, remember, is positive and, and negative north pole and south pole, so a positive side and a negative side, and so it had something to do with a beam of charges. So it was either positively charged or negatively charged. Something was going on. So the first main scientist that just deserves to get um, amazing praise in the 19th century was J.J. Thompson. And he was the first to kind of play with these. And, and essentially, he's looking at the electron is what it was. So with his work with the cathode ray tube, he was able to determine the charge to mass ratio. So he didn't know what the charge was of, of this electron, this, this electron meaning that it's able to move. Um, he wasn't sure of its mass, he wasn't sure of its charge, but he knew that he knew the ratio between the mass and charge, and he was able to determine it through his work with the cathode ray tube. It's, uh, I never memorized this, 1.76 times 10 to the 8 coulombs per gram. Remember, coulomb is a unit of charge, and gram is, is a mass. So once that was, once they knew the ratio, then is, if you could just give me the one of those, I could give you the other because you just divide it out. And one of the most famous was uh, the Millikan's oil drop experiment. So this happened about 1909, and it's brilliant. It's just brilliant how, how he did it. Essentially, here's, here's a schematic. Uh, he had some oil that he atomized. He put it in a kind of a perfume squirter, and he atomized the oil so that it was just tiny, tiny little droplets. Uh, not many more than an atom, just a few, maybe a few hundred atoms in a blop. So real, real fine mist. And he had a hole in the bottom of the plate so that as the mist fell, you know, one in a billion would fall through that tiny little hole into the second chamber below it. And the top of the 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 top of the roof of that second chamber was one was positively charged, and the the floor was negatively charged. So, what he did is, as he, as it dropped, he had a source of X rays, and he he bombarded the oil with the X rays and made the oil negative. The oil then repelled against each other. They tried to stay away from each other because it was all negative. And then as it fell, he had a positive roof. So gravity was pushing down on the oil, and the positive roof, which was connected to, a, to electricity, was pulling up on the oil, and eventually it stayed put. It just stayed still. So it just kind of floated in air like this. And so you knew the difference between gravity and you knew what its electricity, electricity pulling up, and gravity pulling down, 
and as soon as it stayed still, he had an eyepiece right here, he could look, and as soon as he had a, a blob of oil that just floated in air right in the middle and not moved, then he knew that he had the right electricity on the, on the roof. He measured the voltage and from that was able to determine what the charge of the electron is. That's absolutely brilliant. So he found the charge of the electron and then he did the charge so that he could find the mass. Because remember, Thomson had already determined the charge to mass ratio. And so as he found the charge, he just put it in and uh, it, it was the mass. So you're going to have a mass of, uh, let's see, so it was 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 is the is the coulomb of the electron and then this one was what JJ Thompson found out coulombs per gram and so this this was what he found uh, from his from how much electricity he was putting in how much charge must it have been that's pulled that the that the positive terminal on that roof was pulling up on that on that oil and he determined that it was going to be nine time or 9.10 uh, times 10 to the negative 28 grams so you have this tiny tiny little mass of electron is so tiny um, ridiculous negative 28 grams means there's 20 there's 27 zeros a decimal and 27 zeros and then a nine that's how little it is in terms of a gram and a gram is about the the weight of a raisin so pretty pretty cool so another thing that was being found during this time um, is radioactivity. And so a radioactive substance is something that's emitting um, some kind of a, a beam of something. So it's either falling apart in a certain way. It's either throwing out small pieces of matter or energy in order to become more stable. And uh, several, of, several of these radioactive elements were discovered during this this time primarily by um, uh, three Frenchmen Marie and Pierre Cur Curie were married couple um, Marie Curie only woman ever to, to receive two Nobel Prizes one in physics and one in chemistry and uh, Henri Becquerel um, also um, interesting how that they discovered some of these materials. They would be working with material and realize that photographic plates that were not developed would all, all of a sudden become developed. Like it, there was energy that normally was in the, like light would have to do it, but yet it was being bombarded out of this material. So it, something was different about it than any other stuff that they had dug out of the ground. Uh, poor, poor Curies, both of them, I think, died of cancer because they were radiated for most of their life. But um, amazing what they what they discovered, and most of it within a decade. Another top player that uh, played with radioactivity was Ernest Rutherford, and he would have um, some kind of a radioactive material, some kind of a radium, or oh, there's many of the really big. Uh, elements, large elements, large um, atomic number elements are all radioactive, All many of them are. He would put it in a lead block that would keep it from going in other directions and he would send it out a hole so that he could have a beam. And then he passed it through plates in the that were, were positive and negative. So just like just like when they started playing with the with the cathode ray tube and they could deflect the beam of electrons just with a positive and negative like magnets or electricity uh, he was able to do this and he found that that if you had a a plate like a like a, um, a photographic plate that would respond to light you could get a beam uh, touching the top uh, that was deflected up and the the top the top um, plate was charged positive so that meant that it was negative was going up towards the positive and it was hitting the photographic plate. So you had a beam, and they call those beta beams, so beta radiation. And it turned out that that is electrons. So beta radiation is, is sending out very high speed, high energy electrons. 
um, there was a, a dot right in the middle of the plate that was not deflected by positive or negative, so that must be a different beam. Uh, that was called gamma. So the Greek letter alf the Greek alphabet uh, starts with alpha, beta, gamma. So gamma, the G in Greek, is the third letter in the alphabet. And so if that third one, gamma, uh, was not deflected and it just goes straight, turns out that that's not material at all. There's no, there's no mass there. It's just energy. It's gamma radiation is just higher than x-rays, um, higher than light, higher than infrared, and it's just high energy electromagnetic radiation. Then the one that would deflect it down was, um, you know, the down plate was, an, was negative, so it must be positive, and you didn't have as much of deflection, and it was alpha beams. So if you just look at the angles, you could already tell that this didn't deflect down as much. This deflected up a lot. So this must be lighter. It's a material that's positive, that's negatively charged, and it is moving at a bigger angle, so it must be lighter. This is moving at a lesser angle, so it's, you know, it's, it's resistant to a change in motion, and so it's heavier. Turns out that alpha radiation is essentially the inside of a helium nucleus. So it's two protons, two electron or two neutrons, uh, together. So, so this material, this alpha radiation material is just sending off stuff. It's breaking apart. It's so um, unstable that it's just falling apart. Um, and as, as it's falling apart, it's, it's throwing out energy and material as it's breaking down into simpler things. Amazing. Um, Ernest Rutherford really, really did a lot um, to, to come up with the idea of of how an atom actually works. So right about the turn of the century, the idea, which was J.J. Thompson again, this was his idea, he called it the plum pudding model. J.J. Thompson was British, and so at Christmas you would have plum pudding, which was a basically just a kind of a bread pudding uh, that was kind of steamed, and it had raisins and nuts and candy fruit and stuff embedded in kind of a bread. So he said, ah, the negatives and the positives must be mixed up just like plum pudding, where the, the negatives are these little dots inside, like raisins inside raisin bread. That must be what it is. And that was the prevailing view. Um, but Rutherford was about to do another experiment. Um, he sent a graduate student named Ernest Marston uh, to do this experiment, he has a photograph, he has a, a plate that's colored with fluorescent uh, paint that can show a dot if you have a, if a beam of alpha particles hits it. Kind of makes a little dot like an old television would do. He put a block of lead with some alpha wave radiation material in it, some kind of a um, radiating element in it, and he made a beam just like that they did, Ernest, just like he did before made a beam, and he shot it at a piece of gold foil, like gold leaf. So this would be like a little piece of gold paper that they use to put your name on your Bible or uh, put the gold leaf on the dome of the Capitol building. It's just very, very little, thin gold, probably two or three layers of gold material. So, so this would be one layer of gold, two layer of atoms width wide. So the whole gold foil is not very thick. And, but it's made up of atoms. Well, what he found was remarkable and, and, not, and unexpected. He didn't really know what he was going to get. It's a brilliant how he set it up. So it wasn't that he was totally a doofus. He understood. He just didn't think it was possible because the view at the time was that all matter was solid and it had positives and negatives inside it. It was like little balls, right? Well, what he found was different. He, he beamed through the foil, and instead of it, it going straight through like he expected it to do, it bounced off and deflected in different ways. So sometimes it deflected at a slight angle, or sometimes at a more of, more of an acute angle. And then every once in a while, he got a beam backwards towards the front that, was, that he couldn't believe. When, he, when Marsden came with the results, he was like, no, do it again you're crazy, you didn't do it right, you mess it up. Because he couldn't imagine, when he was doing his paper on this, when he was re reporting this to the, to the society, he said, imagine shooting a, a 
howitzer shooting a, a missile at a piece of toilet paper and the missile bouncing off of the toilet paper and coming back at you. That's exactly what you've got here. That, that seriously heavy beam of radiation would be like a train going, th going through a clothesline. It, sh it wouldn't have had any uh, resistance at all. But yet we have obvious evidence that, it's, that sometimes it bounces back. Well, the only thing he could do is change the model. So they're no longer the plum pudding, but in in, instead, if all of the, the mass was actually concentrated at the center and very little mass was concentrated in the outside, then most of the atom is empty. Most of the atom is, the, the beam was simply pass right through and go and you make a big dot in the back. But if occasionally it hit it like a pool ball, it would deflect it slightly and you get a slight deflection. And then every once in a while, if it was a direct hit, it would bounce back just like playing billiards. And so he knew that the atom did not look like what they thought it looked like. There was evidence against it. So the nuclear atom, okay, Rutherford's atom, um, and you've seen you've seen pictures kind of of it this way. This was this idea that you had a nucleus with almost a hundred percent of the mass concentrated at the center and then surrounded by a cloud of electrons and electrons weigh almost nothing and they're swirling around kind of in a, cl a steamy cloud around this outside not like a train tracks really really small okay and angstrom is 10 to the minus 10th okay so we're we're more than a billionth of a meter small very 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 tiny um, and then the the protons and neutrons were discovered later. So the electron was the first, and you had you had something in the middle that then asked the question, what's in the middle? If the electron is outside, what's on the inside? And that was the, the, new, the new thing to study then. So you have this cloud approximately 10 to the 10th, and then the nucleus 10 to the 15th. All right, so this is five orders of magnitude. So it's it's 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times smaller. So 10 to the 15 is not just 5 less than 10. It's 5 times 10 times 10 times 10. 10 to the 5th smaller. So it's ridiculously small. So if you had a stadium and you put a, a, a little marble at the, at the 50 yard line on a stadium, the people in the back row of seats would be where the electrons are swirling around and the nucleus would be the marble. And almost everything they, everything in the room is emptiness. There's nothing there at all. So most of matter is made up of nothing. It's pretty amazing. So the summary is that eventually there are three. You've got a proton, which is positive, uh, and a neutron, which is neutral. They weigh about the same so in terms of atomic mass units, that's, that's really the, the average of a proton and a neutron. Um, a proton is the teeniest, time, teeniest a bit less than a neutron, but there's such there's so much the same that you can consider that a proton and a neutron is equal to one. And then an electron is going to be 1,800 times smaller. So in terms of mass, it would be like you standing on a scale and a ladybug crawling on your shoe as you're standing on the bathroom scale. It's not going to make any difference to your weight. It's not going to weigh more or less. It's negligible. So the electron weighs almost nothing. Proton and neutron, uh, you're going to have a scale of essentially one, one nucleide. So positive, negative, or po positive or neutral, uh, they're going to weigh the same, and then the electron very nothing. So the neutron has no charge. Electron has a negative charge and a positive charge for the proton. And in a neutral atom, a proton and electron are going to be equal. And so there's not going to be a charge to an atom. An element is going to be neutral, usually.